Yo, congratulations to Mike Byrne. You are the winner of this week's giveaway. Enjoy your hot comics list. Comic fam, we are back on the mic, and I'm sitting here with Gem Mint from Gem Mint Collectibles. How you doing, man? Man, I'm doing wonderful. How about you? Dude, I'm doing great. Can you believe that we've been covering this hot comics list, courtesy of Key Collector Comics? Use that code TOM101 to unlock a free one-week subscription to the best comic book app for three months now. Yeah, it's been three months. It's gone by fast, and I like what we got planned for you guys today for this video that kind of breaks down the books that we've been talking about for these three months and kind of our personal opinion on where we think they are, should they be there, where are they going, and all that good stuff. I haven't ever followed this part of the market as closely. For the last two years, Russ and I have been covering the trending list, which is a lot more volatile. And those comics tend to move week over week, which is why you don't see a lot of repeat offenders. But this list is very different. Yeah, see, I'm different. We talk about a lot of books that would have never been on my radar, a lot of newer books, a lot of variants, stuff that never really personally interests me. So the list has given me a good opportunity to learn about more books that are moving in the market. So comic fam, this is going to be about more reflection and subscribe because we're going to be doing this coverage probably quarterly because now that we have had a chance to analyze all the books that we've been discussing, we have some thoughts. The list that we normally cover weekly is provided by Key Collector app. They're the ones that track all the data, they put the list together, and we just report on it. So this is going to be a different video because it's strictly our opinions on where we think these books should be, uh, do we think they're good buys, are they long-term, short-term, or what have you. So keep in mind that this video is just our opinion. So let's start it out with some movie slash show spec. We've chatted about a lot of books over the last few months, and there was a couple of them that caught my eye more than others. And the first one actually made it on the hot list this week for the first time. And we're talking about Avengers number eight. I think this is a good buy. It's a Silver Age Avengers book. It's the first appearance of Kang the Conqueror. And this was a spec book for a long time. Collectors assumed he would show up in the MCU at some time. Then it was highly spec that he would show up in Endgame somehow. There was some kind of leaked script or something that ended up being bogus. But now he has attention again. They're saying that he may be the villain in one of these upcoming MCU movies, right? Correct. The rumor is that we have Jonathan Majors from Lovecraft Country that's going to be taking on this time-traveling menace in the Ant-Man franchise, which has me torn a little bit because the Ant-Man franchise tends to be more of a heist and low-key you know, action movie where Kang is such a giant villain that causes so much ruckus. However, I've been chatting about Kang coming on the mic for over two years now with Endgame incorporating time travel with Young Avengers on so many members minds and next gen heroes being specced on heavily. Kang has been the go to villain of choice for me. I personally bought this book earlier this month not even with this spec news known at the time. Yeah, we're kind of back to square one with this book. Like, he's got to show up in one of these phases, whether it's phase four, phase five. He's just a good character that could be incorporated. And like you said, maybe he'll show up in Ant-Man. Let's take a look at the numbers because this book is seeing $300 average sales. There's a lot of copies between the $200 and $1,000 range because it's Silver Age. There's a lot of low-grade copies available. But let's take a look at the higher-end sales because we saw major records being broken. This time last year, a 7.5 went for $700. Bucks. This week in 48 hours, we saw a slew of record breakers. The first... $1,025. The next, $1,100. It creeped up to $1,150. Then it jumped to $1,400 and ended at $1,500, Jem. Yeah, and I like that it's a Silver Age book. To me, those are always your safe bets. Kang, known to be a thorn in the side of the Fantastic Four as well. Speaking of which, Fantastic Four number one saw some big gains as well. A 7.5 went from $48,000 to $69,000. Another book that I'm surprised we haven't really been talking about, but I think it's because they're so far out of reach. Yo, Jem, we chatted about my movie slash show spec of choice. What about yours based off the last few months? Yeah, my TV spec has got to be that Star Wars Clone Wars number one, the first appearance of Ashoka Tano. We know that Rosario Dawson is going to play the character, and it just seems to be the biggest TV book. However, I don't think this is a long-term buy. I think this is a book that needs to get sold right before the season comes out. I think we're going to see this book dip afterwards. So not all of these books are these long-term investments. There are some that you can make money on getting in and getting out, and I think that this is one of those. 
Yeah, we're going to be seeing this character on screen, likely at least in trailer in coming weeks, coming months. But given that the prices for these books and the variants, which we'll get to, are just continually impressing us on the mic, I think that although the time frame may be narrowing to be able to have this be a profitable purchase, it is definitely one worth every member's of the community's attention. I am anxiously awaiting for any teaser, any image from the set, something to watch these numbers skyrocket. Yeah, you make a good point because if we look at sales on these books, September 17th, a 9.8 sold for $1,725. Uh, on September 20th, we had a sale for $899.99 for a raw copy. Then we look at the variant, a 9.8 sold for $3,700 in August. So I don't think it's a good buy to buy this book at four grand and expect to flip it for more. I mean, it might start selling for a little bit more, but I feel like this is the time to sell, not the time to buy. What's also interesting is that variant that you speak of, the Dave Filoni, the Dark Horse 100 limited to only 1,000 printed and distributed to only 100 retailers, recently sold in fair condition. This was a rough looking copy for $300. So although the high end copies may not be the best investment right now, I think the lower grade copies has some potential and some meat left on the bone. Cover A also has a newsstand which has average highs of $1,000. Now we haven't seen any recent sales in the last three months, but we're going to talk more about newsstands later on in the show. Yeah, that one may be the dark horse of the batch. It may surprise a lot of collectors. Now, let's take a look at something I feel like has made a big change or reintroduction back to collectors' interest when collecting. We're talking about the blue chips. Let's chat about our favorite blue chip specs right now. Yeah, we call them blue chip keys because they're safe buys. These are books that typically retain or appreciate in value regardless on what's going on around it. This next book is a prime example of that. It's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, issue one. Dude, I was so surprised over the last couple months watching the first print break records and then to see what it did really to the market in its entirety by making the second, third, and fourth printings just more and more valuable. It's caused a change in the marketplace. Yeah, it just makes me feel good inside that it's not because of a new movie coming out or a new cartoon coming out. It's just appreciated, and that makes me happy, and I'm glad to see those type of books on this list. I think TMNT number one is always going to be a good book to own. It's always going to go up. Unless there's some type of big economical crash, you should be a safe bet with TMNT. So CGC 9.4 copies had an all-time high record of $17,250, but there were two 9.4 sales last week that totally obliterated that record. We had the first sale for $31,000. This was via a private transaction. Then we had a copy that disappeared from a trusted dealer site that was listed at $32,500. Now, Key Collector is still trying to get that final price, but it's probably sold for something close to that high record. And that's not all for Turtle Madness, comic fam. We have four other books to discuss. Second printings hitting records this week. A 9.6 used to go for $3,250. All new record this week of $5,600. Raw second printings are going for $3,000 on average, which is up from $2,000 earlier this year. We also saw a CGC 9.8 hit an all-new record at $3,300, and then that same week, another sold at $3,500. That's two different records broken, both up from 1950, their prior record. And now, let's actually jump from the printings to just another TMNT major milestone key. We have Raphael number one, the first appearance of Casey Jones, hitting an all-new, all-time record. Up from $1,800 at a 9.8, finishing up the week at $3,500. Yeah, that's what happens when these keys start getting hot. You get the, like, the surrounding orbiting keys start blowing up too, like that Raphael number one, which is also a magazine oversized comic. It just companions so well with the first four issues in that TMNT run. Now, TMNT was your choice, and it was very impressive. I couldn't stop thinking about Giant Size X-Men number one over the last few months. The prices were staggering, and we had some major records that were broken over the course of two months that puts this book as my favorite blue chip book that's been on the list in three months. I think this one has still not seen the heights that it could reach. 
I'll remind the community that this book came up on our radar after the Comic Link Summer Featured Auction saw a 9.8 white page copy go for $16,257. Just three weeks later at the Heritage Platinum Session Signature Auction, we saw a new 9.6 record breaker white pager hit $9,000. And at the same auction, the new big sale marking the trend for all other X-Men books, pushing so many up to new grounds, a 9.8 white page copy selling for $19,200. This is my blue chip book of choice right now. And I think we have other X-Men books to be considering. Yeah, it's a great pick. I mean, Giant Size X-Men 1 is a book that's always going to sustain. It's going to appreciate. And uh, it's kind of funny to me because it was only the book to get when X-Men 1 and Hulk 181 got kind of uh, out of reach for collectors. So everybody started going to the Giant Size X-Men. But now that that book is getting out of reach, we're going to start seeing these other X-Men books start taking off. I'm talking about stuff like X-Men 221, uh, the first appearance of Mr. Sinister. You know they got to be bringing him into the MCU somehow. A 9.8 newsstand sold for $575 on September 18th. And then you have stuff like X-Men 266, the first appearance of Gambit, or the first full appearance if you want to get technical. Uh, but that book's, uh, and the 9.8 is about a $500 book. Those are asking prices on eBay right now. We're going to see those type of books start heating up, and we're going to still continue to see these big monster books like X-Men 1 continue to make record-breaking prices up until the release of these X-Men movies in the MCU. A CGC 7.0 sold for $21,000 in June. In July, we had a very similar sale, just about $500 less. And in September, we had a 6.0 sell for $16,000. So I'm going to be keeping an eye on X-Men 1 because I'm sure we're going to see that continue to make gains as we get closer to these movie releases. Next section of this list to discuss is something that has clearly been on the minds of collectors. Did we coin this phrase, Jem? I think we might have created that with us just bantering, trying to create these videos, but the next gen heroes. Now, here's my thing with these books. I totally understand why some of them are selling for so much money, especially ones that have proven low print runs like that Wizard First 9.5. We know only 284 ever existed and that there are factually less than that around now. So I totally get that, but I think a lot of the long-term value in these books is contingent on how well these characters are received by the masses. I don't know that all comic readers are on board with all these characters, and if they don't perform, Marvel's going to give up on them. So I only think we're going to see continued success here if they're successful in the mainstream. What I keep thinking about is just how long it's going to take for these characters to even get to the point where we're getting some type of teasers, you know, like years out. We have to see casting. We have to see trailers. We have to see hints of the direction where Marvel's going to take us. Otherwise, books that we're actually about to talk about, like Miles Morales, they start to be pretty volatile and they go up and down, like a fluctuation of prices in the thousands in as little as 60 days. Dude, and their comics got to sell. I'm not so sure that Miss Marvel or Spider-Gwen or Ghost Spider were so successful in comics. So I don't know that Marvel's going to necessarily push these characters unless they're making money. All right, well, let's take a look at some of the big picks that we have based off of the books that are spiking and the ones that are hot indeed. And you did mention it. We have the Young Avengers 9.5 Wizard First Edition. And we've been breaking news about the record breakers for a couple months now i'll remind the community that this was a under 300 dollar book back in february and now that the information is out there kudos to key collector for spotlighting this comic because it's a major unique key it's seeing hands trading it for upwards of 25 to three thousand dollars repeatedly yeah, and it deserves that money. I mean, we know it's super scarce. And not only is the book scarce, but like the label, like the CGC 9.5, it's like not something that you can get in any book. Again, you know, it, it's a good buy if the characters take off. If Young Avengers become a household name, sure. But I think there's a lot of risk in that because if those characters don't become a big name, then that book might go back down to a $300 book. All right, so based off of the characters that we are thinking our opinion has a really good chance. 
My pick's going to be Kamala Khan. So let's actually chat about Kamala Khan's numbers. And I would love to hear your thoughts, Jem. Captain Marvel's second print, we saw at the end of August a 9.0 go for $1,100. I think that Kamala Khan has enough variety in her variants, given that there's a cameo, there's a second print cover appearance, there's a first full appearance. There's a second print that's selling really well and even scarcer printing of that first full that's selling aggressive regardless of rumors. I think that the variety and the fandom behind her puts this character in the lead for me. Man, that's a bold statement, man. I got to disagree. You know, I think Marvel is definitely pushing this character. They want this to be one of their household names, which is why they put her in the Avengers video game. I mean, I totally see all those first appearances being key issues. That makes a lot of sense. Again, I think it's contingent on how well she performs. How much money does Kamala Khan bring into Marvel and Disney? Because if she's not bringing in the money, I don't see them continuing to push this character and they would eventually give up on her. So it's just my opinion, but it's not something that I would invest in. The one that I would invest in is the only one of these next-gen heroes that has really taken off has been, for the most part... Uh, globally accepted as a big Marvel player, and that's Miles Morales. We see his first appearance performing extremely well, both the A cover and the 1 out of 25 ratio. We're seeing crazy sales in the eight to $9,000 range, new stand editions of the A cover uh, in the $8,000 range. So he's a character that I think has proven himself. He has a, su a successful movie. His comics sell. He has the uh, video game coming out now. Uh, you know, self-titled video game, not just like a cameo in another game. So that's my pick for one of these next-gen heroes. I think he's already tried and true. This week, we saw the fourth highest sale of any edition in any grade of this comic book. A CGC 9.6 newsstand edition sold in under one day for a shocking $6,675. This is astonishing. This right here means that the newsstand variant is indeed a collector, favored collectible that is here to stay. So the video that Tom and I do every week are comics that will define a generation. Every now and then, though, a trendy book kind of makes its way on the list, and we kind of got to talk about them. Do we think they'll define a generation? That's a good point, Jem, because I'll remind the community that back in the early 2000s when CGC first came on the scene, the two most graded comic books that defined that generation of collectors was Spawn 1 and Wolverine Origins number 1. It doesn't necessarily mean that these books are the end-all, be-all books. They are trending that made their way onto the hot list, but... They could be volatile, and typically numbers like 10, 9, 8, and 7, they may fluctuate in and out of the list. Let's chat about some of the ones that made its way on here that we don't think have the legs to stand. One of the first books that we talked about that we didn't really feel would be a good long-term buy is Superboy Issue 9, The First Appearance of King Shark. Definitely a hot book. It was hot when he made his appearance on The Flash Show, but now that we have him in the uh, Suicide Kills Justice League video game and the Suicide Squad 2 movie, we're seeing a lot of big sales. $300 for a 9.8, $600 for the DCU logo variant that just sold this month, September 9th. But for me, I don't think this book is going to maintain those values after this video game and this movie comes out. It was definitely a perfect storm. DC fandom, video game announcements, trailers dropping for a movie. This book was trending. It made its way onto the list because it doubled in price. Heck, you could get a 9.8 earlier in the year for $100. That DCU logo variant sold for under $200 at one point in the last two months. So comic fam, some books may make their way on here, but... Is King Shark someone that you're going to compare next to like Hulk 181, First Wolverine? I don't think so. Definitely not. All right. And then the next one that came and went, one that surprised us, but clearly surprised collectors because of how much it was trending. We're talking about the, I, I guess we're calling it the variant pandemic book of choice because it was so difficult to acquire because of so many comic book stores shutting down and Diamond itself shutting down. We have Outlaws number one, that one in 50 variant that went for on average $500 and then a week later at 9.8 for above 1000 What do you think about that one, man? Because I, th I think that's gone. I think that's going to tank. 
Yeah, this is just a book that's rare and scarce, so people are buying it. But is it really going to be sought after? I mean, there's store-exclusive variants on the CGC Census that only have a handful of graded copies, but they don't sell for a lot of money. So scarce and rare doesn't always mean valuable. Typically, it's got to be of some type of key importance, and I don't think this book is it. Comic fam, make sure you hit the subscribe button, slap the like button, and comment down below. I want to know your thoughts on where you think these books are going. It'll enter you to win a copy of Wolverine number one, the In Hyuk Lee variant that I did. We've had so many collectors' preferences change in the last quarter from specking on next gen heroes to the love of second, third, fourth printings, and now to the biggest market trend that I think we need to start talking about right here, right now, the newsstand variant love. Yeah, newsstand editions have been hotter than ever. They've been commanding a premium in books like Amazing Spider-Man 300, who had crazy 9.8 sales for the regular cover. We're talking about $3,600 followed up by $3,750. We have a newsstand 9.8 that sold for $4,500 in late June. Then we have books like Amazing Spider-Man 361. The regular cover and 9.8 sells for about $600. But the newsstand and 9.8 has sales of $720. And that was a record this week, comic fam. You got to be up on your newsstands. I'm going to throw this out there. The first appearance of Spidey 2099. Amazing Spider-Man 365, the 9.8 newsstand, broke records this very week. Go check out the Hot 10 list over on the Key Collector app to see where that landed because I was very surprised. And man, I love me some Miguel O'Hara. Spider-Man 2099 is one of my favorite characters, but I don't like this book. Isn't it just like a five-page preview of Spider-Man 2099 issue one that's thrown into this book, but it still gets the first appearance credit? Oh, not only that, it has the hologram that's notorious for fading out so terribly. Yeah, it just doesn't feel like his first appearance. It's like one of those gimmicky hologram books. Uh, it doesn't look like a 2099 book, but hey, it, it's going for what it's going for, and the new stands are definitely commanding a premium. Thanks so much for watching the video today, comic fam. Make sure to let us know what you think about it, and as always, stay minty fresh and geek responsibly. Enough said. Comic fam, only a few more weeks to join. We are in current enrollment for the October Mystery Mail Call, and every member is going to be getting this dope copy of Dune Issue 1, the Ben Temple Smith variant. Whether it be a trade dress or undressed, it's randomized. Support the show, but give us an excuse to send you some comic books. Hit the link in the description.